But this was another topic that I personally enjoy as a representative example of a class of problems. And in this particular question, we are given a library function that is already implemented and we need to write a wrapper around it that provides some additional functionality. So maybe I'll, I, I, once again, I forget if I've talked about this, but when I've talked about this, is this sound like a good thing for me to talk about now or has everyone already seen this example and no need to do it? Okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna assume that this is, this is either new or at the very least interesting. So let's talk about this. And I think, once again, this is a kind of a class of problems where there's some existing library function. And in this case, it's read, but it could easily be something uh, like malloc. And you need to write some wrapper around malloc. But in any case, for this particular example, we have a driver API that reads up to 512 bytes from a peripheral. And you pass in a buffer as input to this, and you get back the number of bytes that were copied into your buffer, the number of bytes that were read. And it could be anywhere between zero and 512 bytes that were ultimately read. And each time you call read, you get zero, zero to 512 bytes copied into this buffer. So this is an API, this is a library that already exists. You don't need to implement this API. What you're being asked to implement is a wrapper such like this, such like this below. This wrapper uh, allows you to specify how many bytes you want to get. So it, there's a couple of ways of interpreting this. We'll look at the code for this in a second, but you still provide a buffer as input, but now rather than getting back anywhere between zero and 512 bytes, we instead receive anywhere between zero and count bytes. And whether it's zero to count or exactly count is kind of an implementation detail. We can talk about how to do it either way. But in any case, you no longer have complete flexibility in terms of the number of bytes. You have this lower number. So the question is, well, how do you go about implementing that? And there's a couple of different, different things aspects to this question. One aspect is, are you required to use this function prototype that they provide, or are you being given the opportunity to implement anything that you'd like? And that is going to drive your solution. The second part, second question you'd want to ask before implementing this is, do I expect multiple threads to be calling this function, or is there only going to be a single thread calling this function? So for my particular solution, I'm assuming that we have to use the API that was given to us by the interviewer. And I'm also assuming that it is single threaded. Well, at least single threaded with regards to, to the threads that would be calling this function. So the problem here, once again, is that we are wrapping around that existing read function. And that existing read function might return anywhere between 0 and 512 bytes. But if the person who called this function only passed in 128, that means their buffer is only going to have size 128. So we wouldn't be able to wrap around read and pass in the original buffer passed in by the client because we might end up reading more than we have space for it which means that all of our reads now need to occur on our own internal buffer. Our own internal buffer of size 512, and I made it static, which is why that question of single threaded comes into play. And this single static buffer is always going to be what we read into. And all of our other code is simply going to be taking data out of this internal buffer. The very first time we call this function, we call the function read bytes, no data has been read so far. This internal buffer is empty. The length of the buffer, in terms of how much data is valid in that buffer, is zero. 
we have not read anything. So the offset, our read offset into that buffer is similarly zero. And now what we want to do is start copying data or start acquiring data and then ultimately copying it into this client's buffer. So for this particular implementation, I am saying that if you pass in a value of 128 for count, then that means you need to return exactly 128 bytes. You're not allowed to return any more. You're not allowed to return any less. So what we're going to do is we have a while loop. Essentially, while there are still bytes that need to be read, continue to try and do something. So we're going to use this count as kind of a local counting variable. What we need to figure out first is, is there data in this buffer to read, or do we need to call read in order to acquire some new data? So we can check, is the overall space, is the overall amount of data in this buffer minus how much of it we've read greater than zero? And obviously, the very first iteration, it's not greater than zero. It's exactly those zero bytes remaining. But even on subsequent iterations, uh, there may or may not be data left available in this internal copy of the buffer. If there is not data available, then we just call read. Once again, our read bytes are supposed to wrap around read. So we can call read. We pass in our, switch to highlighter mode. We can pass in our buffer and we store how much data we got back here and also our static variable buffer length. And buffer length is gonna be any number between zero and, and uh, what did I say, 512. Now that we've just read this data, the read offset is zero. It's like we've just we've just read we just acquired the data from the peripheral. We have not yet returned any data from the person who calls read bytes. So then, on the next iteration of the loop, we will have some data to read. The buffer length minus read offset now should have a non-zero amount of data available. So we need to figure out how much data we need to copy. Because we might not have space based on this count. We might not have space available to copy the entire buffer. So if count is less than remaining, we'd use count. If remaining is less, we use remaining. Essentially, we're using the min of these two. And then we mem copy from the internal buffer to our outgoing buffer the number of bytes that we wanted to copy. Then we update how many bytes it is we just copied. We, inc we uh, decrement our count, because if we were originally trying to read 128 bytes and we just read uh, 20 bytes, then we have 108 bytes left to read. So we're going to use this count as the number of bytes that still need to read. And then we also update our read offset. Because if, if the buffer, if the uh, the amount of data we've just read from the buffer isn't all the data left, we need to make sure that the next time someone calls read bytes, this read offset is correct, so we can then read the next data. And once this while loop is has uh, gone around enough times, finally we will have read all the data and can return. And the client has the has the number of bytes that they asked for. And I just realized I would said one thing wrong earlier. Uh, I did actually have an escape clause here. If I call read from the peripheral and there is no data to read from the peripheral, then I do break. So there is a case where we return less data than was requested but it's only when there was literally no data to read from the peripheral. There was no data backed up. Obviously, we could have gotten rid of this line if we wanted read bytes to be a blocking function such that we always re returned exactly the number of bytes requested. So that was a whole lot of me talking. Uh, I apologize for that, but I wanted to make sure I had time to actually go through all of this code. Uh, Let's let me let me open up for questions. And first, 
let me make sure do people un <laughs> do people understand what it was we were trying to accomplish are there any uh, questions about what it was we were trying to accomplish given this original set of requirements yeah uh glenn i think this is clear to me at least um yeah i have one question uh, sure. so you mentioned that we need to uh, maintain an internal buffer right so yep. any recommendation on the size of that internal buffer so i made the buffer 512 bytes and i did so for hopefully a pretty good reason which is this existing read function can return anywhere between 0 and 512 bytes so we already know what the upper limit is that that pre-existing library function were most return. So we can make our internal buffer to this, or the static buffer inside this function be exactly that upper limit. Okay, got it. Yeah, and it, um, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, so it, it's worth knowing that you one someone could have implemented this to rather than having this be a static, array a static buffer internal to this function you could have potentially called malloc each time and allocated new memory each time for this but i think having a static array is more efficient than allocating memory with malloc when you know what the size is going to be or at least know what a reasonable maximum size is going to be Yeah, uh, got it. Uh, I, I know you, uh, a friend mentioned that you assume that it is a single threaded uh, call. Uh, so yeah. what, what would be the you know, major change if you know, multiple threads call this? So do we have to maintain uh, you know, uh, per thread uh, uh, internal buffer or uh, is it gonna be single buffer guarded with uh, locks? Presumably, you'd 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 have a singular buffer goaded by locks. Though it kind of depends on how you phrase the question, uh, or how the question was phrased to you. But my assumption would be that you would need to make sure this these variables, this data, was protected. And if it wasn't clear, what we've what I've essentially just implemented here is a little mini circular buffer that gets replaced from time to time. We have a effectively a read pointer and a write pointer. The write pointer never really changes because we only write to it once and then we continuously read from it. But we have here a circular buffer. So we could solve the multi-threaded problem in the exact same way that we've talked about it uh, previously. We could use a, a singular lock. So we could call lock up here and then unlock down here and call it a day. Or we could use some atomic operations with regards to protecting these three, well, mostly these two, but protecting all three of these objects. Uh, it would be a little bit trickier with atomics. Uh, what we would probably need to do is rather than having a singular buffer, you'd probably need to have two buffers because at, at the point at time that there's no data left in the current buffer to read and you need to read more data, it's possible that another thread is still reading that old data, but just simply updated the read pointer. So you need to make sure that the, the new read occurred into a new buffer such that any older entities were still reading or using the, uh, the previous buffer. The, oh, and the, the and the pointer to the buffer that we receive, it's, it's assumed that there's memory allocated for that. It's assumed that whoever called this function passed in memory uh, that's at least this large, at least count bytes in length. So yes, uh, and th that's I mean, it's a reasonable assumption if someone. If you're trying to implement memcopy, 
you as the implementer simply assume that the output buffer is at least as big as the number of bytes that they've passed in the copy. And there's no good way for you as an implementer of this function to do anything to protect against that. Okay. Uh, so there's another question. Uh, wouldn't malloc become complicated as a static buffer allows us to allocate and hold on the data with the same buffer versus malloc free and tracking whether to allocate again or not? Um, I, I would say it, well, I, I don't necessarily think it's any more complicated uh, because, well, and let's say take the, the single thread case, we know exactly when it is we're going to read. So we know exactly when it is we can release the old buffer and allocate new buffers. Uh, the, I, I brought up malloc and free most, it really applies more to the multi-threaded case where you might have multiple threads who are still using old data, or at least maybe still using old data, and you need a way to make sure that that old data continues to be available until they're done with it. So that way you can use malloc to acquire it, and then the last entity who is still reading from that old buffer, the last person, whoever it is who reads the, the end of that buffer, is then responsible for calling free on that buffer. So that's that. So yes, it it, it might be minutely more complicated. But in the, in the single threaded case, I don't think I think malloc is simply less efficient, not necessarily more complicated. But I think malloc might be would likely be a a requirement, or at least it would be the obvious way approach to solve the problem in the multi-threaded case. So essentially well, this method, I guess, the, essentially this method is blocking until all the buffer is read. Uh, that's where there's, I guess, two potential ways of, of implementing it. If, so going down here again, right, it was just erasing uh, this section highlighted in, in green. With this there, it will return early. Like it will return potentially prior to count bytes being received. But if we got rid of those lines, then it would be blocking. So this is kind of where uh, you need to get some feedback from the interviewer with regards to what they mean by this. Like, does you need to return count bytes in the buffer? Does that mean you need to return exactly count bytes? or you can potentially return fewer than count bytes. And whether or not the answer is yes or no will affect whether or not you would want to have a line like this in here. Cool, excellent. Uh, well, it is uh, the end of the session, uh, 10 o'clock California time. Uh, so if, uh, if you guys have any kind of putting questions or thoughts you'd like to share, happy to answer them now. Uh, Otherwise, uh, I will look forward to seeing some of you next Sunday and potentially uh, more of you next Tuesday for the next coaching session. All right, cool. But well, all right, we're not hearing any any more questions. I will uh, uh, bid you all good evening and uh, see you next time. Uh, Glenn, one, Glenn, one last question. Uh, oh, sure. This is uh, yeah. This, this is generic, uh, right, Chip? Uh, operation question. Uh, so basically, I, I had a negative number like minus one, and I was trying to write shift by uh, some number, and mm -hmm. the result was still minus one. Uh, I yep. couldn't uh, I couldn't understand that logic. Yes. So if you have, let me do this very briefly. So let's say you have a oh, not the right thing. Uh, if you have a, uh, an int eight, let's say, this is this is the the, the representation of minus one, a whole bunch of ones. Uh, this is a two's complement number, and when you do a, a bit shift, uh, you're trying to move everything over right by one. Uh, the uh, sign extension, well, not sign extension, the uh, yeah, sign extension. 
uh, will continue to place more ones, at least logically speaking, up here to move them on over. So if you wanted to avoid that, you could cast to an unsigned dent and then do your shift. Uh, generally doing bit shifting with, with signed types in either direction ends up resulting in these sorts of behaviors where you don't actually get the shifting that you might have expected. Okay, so it's, it's good practice to avoid uh, shifting uh, operation with uh, sign numbers. Uh, that would be my recommendation. I'm, I'm sure those use cases where you might still want that behavior, but it, it, well, assuming that you want to avoid it, using the unsigned should be the the safer route. Okay. 